After completing session two, you should now have a clear picture of your strengths and weaknesses as compared to the model of the self-disciplined achiever. Perhaps for the first time in your life, you're able to objectively see which of your attitudes and behaviors have been acting as barriers to developing the kind of self-discipline that will enable you to achieve your dreams and ambitions. Now that you have a better understanding of the ten characteristics of the self-disciplined achiever, we're going to provide you with a scientific foundation for CyberVision's unique self-discipline program. In this session, you'll learn how recent scientific discoveries have made it possible for you to acquire, harness, and focus the power of self-discipline, the power to achieve whatever your mind and heart are set on achieving. That power is what sets achievers apart from the mass of ordinary people, people described by American philosopher and writer Henry David Thoreau as leading lives of quiet desperation. That power is what drove great achievers like Dr. Jonas Salk, Ludwig von Beethoven, Albert Einstein, and Mahatma Gandhi. But what does that power consist of? What is the force that motivates high achievers to sustain a long-term effort that might take 10 years, 20 years, or a lifetime to achieve? More importantly, if we can define and isolate such a force, how can you or I tap into it? The force exists, and it has a scientific basis. By the time you've completed the neuropsychology of self-discipline, you'll understand its origins, its strength, and its power. And you'll be armed with all the tools you need to stay in touch with that force in order to accomplish anything you set out to do. There are many self-improvement programs that, like crash diets, offer good short-term results but stop working after a few days or weeks. These programs tend to rely on one of three kinds of motivation. The first is evangelical. A powerful orator, we'll call him Speaker X, comes to town with promises to increase motivation and production after a single seminar or series of seminars. Perhaps your boss encourages you and your co-workers to go. Perhaps he even purchases a block of tickets. Meeting night arrives, you attend, and the speaker is indeed inspirational as are the bells and whistles and songs and slogans that accompany him. It is a fever-pitched, emotionally charged experience that Speaker X has to offer. As he exhorts you to live up to your enormous potential, to work harder, better, and more enthusiastically, to use your talents, to use your mind, you feel power welling up inside you, and the people around you are feeling the same kind of power inside them. Yes, you're all saying, we can be more productive, we can have a better attitude. We can get ahead if we want to. The very air becomes charged with mass enthusiasm. The next day, you're at your desk a half hour early, and you work a half hour past normal quitting time. The same thing happens the day after. You start planning new ways to accomplish your work more effectively. You're feeling happier about the work you're doing. And for the next few weeks, it looks like you're getting more work done in less time than you ever have before but soon your enthusiasm begins to fade and your pace starts to slow down. Even if you have the audio tapes of the speech, it's hard to recapture and sustain the original emotion you felt in the presence of an inspired speaker. And of course, you no longer have the kind of group excitement and energy you experienced the first time around. You're getting tired and bored. Your boss sees productivity fall after an artificial peak and sure enough, when the next motivational speaker comes through town, we'll call him Speaker Y, there's the boss with another block of tickets in hand. This evangelical form of motivation may get short-term results, but it creates an unhealthy dependence on external hype. It's like a drug addiction. You need more and more of an artificial stimulant to reach the same level of false well-being. When you get your shot of motivation, you become enthusiastic and energetic. When the shot wears off, you get sluggish and lethargic. The same problem exists with the second major motivational tool that most self-improvement programs rely on. External rewards, like money, prizes, bonuses for reaching quotas. These are essentially pats on the head from the boss, often desirable pats, but still pats on the head, signals that you've pleased someone else. This method works very well on children, Unfortunately, 
it tends to create a childlike dependence on outside rewards, even in adults. Like evangelical speakers, this carrot-and-stick approach produces only short-term results. External rewards do not increase individual commitment, and most people tend to adapt to them quickly, soon expecting bonuses as a matter of course, and not because they performed above and beyond the call of duty. Rewards are manipulative. People who give them out are always asking themselves, how can I motivate my staff? The truth is, to be truly effective in the long term, motivation must come from within. The third classic motivational tool is a familiar one, fear. Humorists Carl Reiner and Mel Brooks created a comedy album in the early 60s in which Reiner, as a journalist, interviews Brooks, who plays a 2,000-year-old man. Eager to know about life in the distant past, Reiner asks Brooks, what was the major form of transportation in those days? Brooks replies, fear. Fear transported you. Reiner is puzzled. Fear, he asks. Brooks responds, yeah, fear. You see, an animal would growl, and you would go two miles in a minute. It's true, fear is a great motivator. If you don't perform, something undesirable happens. You lose your job. There go the house payments, the car payments, the kids' college tuition, and so on. As the mental dominoes fall, you're motivated to keep performing. But while fear may bring short-term results, it also brings resentment and rapid burnout. It doesn't take long before you're angry at the system that's keeping you going. And anger makes you less productive, which increases your fear. It becomes a vicious cycle with an unpleasant ending. It should be pretty clear by now that these motivational systems aren't motivational at all. Each of them relies on an external stimulus and an artificial situation. And each relies on an initial burst of emotion that fades rapidly when the new situation becomes habitual. You may have tried several of these motivational or goal-setting programs in the past. Perhaps they even contributed to your sense of self-awareness. If so, you've no doubt learned that self-awareness alone is not sufficient to motivate change. It's easy to identify self-defeating behaviors. It's easy to plan strategies for eliminating them. It's easy to turn over a new leaf, but it's very difficult to sustain change for a long enough period of time for your new behavior to become as ingrained in your character as your bad habits were in the past. Having a road map is not enough. You need fuel. The key to developing self-discipline, the power to persistently pursue a long-term goal without giving up until the goal is achieved, is the fuel of internal motivation. It would be nice if we were all born with the patience, drive, and skill it takes to achieve any long-range goal or complete any long-term project, but we're not. Self-discipline is a learned behavior. Years of research at major American universities, primarily California's Stanford University, have proved it. And CyberVision's own research into the latest learning theories of behavioral scientists have confirmed that self-discipline is an acquired characteristic with a basis in behavioral science. The neuropsychology of self-discipline has been developed according to materials gathered from two major sources. Our information comes from our own research into the way human beings learn and from the revolutionary discoveries about the structure and organization of the human brain made by Dr. Carl Prebram. Head of Stanford University's Neuropsychology Research Laboratory, Dr. Prebram is one of the most respected brain scientists in the world. Trained as a neurosurgeon, his research into brain function led to a deep interest in the behavioral sciences. His pioneering work in both of these areas led to the fusion of the two into the science of neuropsychology. As a neuropsychologist, Dr. Prebram studies how the nervous system and its component parts affects human behavior. Those studies have led to two revolutionary discoveries. The neuropsychology of self-discipline incorporates both of them. The first of Dr. Prebram's discoveries explains how the human brain forms visual and sensory images and how those images affect our minds, our bodies, and our behavior. The second discovery is that our behavior is governed by images of achievement, neuronal blueprints of the skills and actions that determine our success or failure in the achievement of our goals. Let's discuss how each of these scientific discoveries 
leads us to understand the power and the origins of self-discipline. Many scientists and psychologists have believed for years that the human brain barely distinguishes a real experience from an imagined one. Best-selling self-help books like Psycho-Cybernetics, Think and Grow Rich, and others have used this belief as their foundation for motivation and change. This idea has also been the cornerstone belief of people involved in metaphysics and the human potential movement. The idea that the brain cannot tell the difference between a real experience and an imagined one has never been scientifically proven until Dr. Prebram's research showed us that it is true. But Dr. Prebram's research did not prove that, as many people think, all you have to do is imagine what you want, and through the magical power of the mind, you will achieve it. If this were true, achievement would be easy. And as anyone who has tried to achieve a long-term goal will tell you, it is not. Put into its proper perspective, this concept of imagination is critical to achievement. But not because imagination possesses a magical power to attract success like a magnet. Imagination is critical to achievement because it evokes the power and emotion that stimulates and sustains the drive to achieve. The human nervous system responds emotionally to imaginary images rich in sensory detail, in sight, sound, touch, taste, and smell, as if they were real. In fact, the brain doesn't distinguish between sensory-rich imagination and reality. That's why the sight of a hand reaching for a murder victim on a movie screen can inspire the same terror, the same rapid heartbeat, and rush of adrenaline as a real threat does. You can perform a simple demonstration of how an imaginary image affects the body's responses right now. Close your eyes and imagine for a moment that you're holding a firm, ripe lemon in your hand. Now bring the lemon up to your mouth and slowly bite into it. As your teeth break through the peel, penetrate the skin, and sink into the flesh of the fruit, imagine the juice exploding into your mouth. What did you experience during this exercise? Did you develop a feeling of bitterness and distaste? Did you pucker up in response? Did you begin to salivate, as you would if you really took a bite out of a lemon? The feeling of bitterness is an emotional response provoked by the imaginary sensation of the lemon juice being absorbed by the mucous membranes in your mouth. The buildup of saliva was a physiological response. Saliva neutralizes the acid level in lemon juice. You can create a similar response by imagining yourself biting into an onion. Rather than experiencing a sense of sourness and a watering of the mouth, your eyes will begin to burn and tear. This power of imagination to create physiological and psychological responses is crucial to the survival of the human species. The images of love and eroticism stimulate sexual response for reproduction. The image of fear stimulates the fight-or-flight response for survival. But our brain's ability to respond to images is a two-edged sword. The person who is dominated and controlled by emotional impressions becomes a victim of his own sensory images. These people act impulsively in response to their feelings. They have little control over their environment. They are easy prey for fear, superstition, and con artists. They are usually unhappy. On the other hand, the person who understands the power of imagery and who can deliberately harness a flood of sensory images to reinforce an intellectually formulated plan as a lifetime source of energy to apply toward positive action. This person uses emotion as fuel. Only when the imagination is harnessed and focused on the benefits and rewards of a specific goal can we light the fires of self-motivation and develop the kind of self-discipline that will help us achieve that goal. Dr. Prebram made a second significant discovery in his research into the brain and human behavior. He found that all of our actions are governed and driven by what he calls an image of achievement. That image of achievement is actually a mental blueprint for reaching a goal. It is made up of images rich in sight, sound, touch, taste, and smell. And in the mind of a highly self-disciplined achiever, it serves as the source of emotional fuel that drives him to work long and hard to reach his goal. Wimbledon tennis champion Stan Smith reported that once he realized that he could compete with some of the world's best tennis players, 
he established a vision of himself becoming the number one tennis player in the world. He imagined winning the Wimbledon title years before he actually achieved it. He saw himself receiving the trophy, dancing at the winner's ball. He felt the worldwide acclaim that would accompany his success. He used that vision as an emotional well from which to draw the necessary strength, persistence, and perseverance to spend thousands of hours in practice and competition, developing the skills and experience that would eventually see him to the realization of his dream. Have you ever heard someone say, I wanted it so bad I could taste it? That's the kind of stimulus that motivates the self-disciplined achiever. Not only can the achiever taste victory, he can see, smell, hear, and feel it too. After years of research, we now know that such deep, sensory-rich images are the actual language of the brain. Although it is actually far more complex, the brain can be compared to a computer. Computers, also referred to as hardware, can do nothing by themselves. They are simply the vehicles for programs called software that tell the computers what to do. Think of the brain as hardware and the imagination, images of achievement, as software. Images of achievement tell your brain what to think, which in turn tells you how to act. The right images can set in motion a chain of events that will lead you towards any kind of achievement you can imagine. Author Joe Himes describes watching a Taekwondo master named Young Tai Lee practicing blows against a straw-covered board. Lee pounded his fist again and again against the board, oblivious to the fact that his knuckles were bleeding. When Lee's practice was over, Himes asked him whether his hand hurt. Lee replied, Not until just now, when I thought about it. When Himes looked astonished, Lee explained further, When I was striking the Makawara board as you came in, my mind was on my home in Korea. Though I was standing here, I was seeing the mountains I knew as a youngster and the children I played with, hearing their laughter and my mother's voice. I was unaware of the pain in my hand. Lee then told a dramatic story of his own Taekwondo master, who once underwent a sinus operation with only his own concentration for an anesthetic. How is that possible, Hyams asked. Regulate your breathing, Lee replied. Fix your eyes and mind on something else, perhaps a rock or a spot on the floor or ceiling. Concentrate on that object, savor it, taste it, give it color and smell the dimension. Let it absorb all your thoughts and concentration, and the pain will diminish. If we replace the word object in Lee's description with the word goal, we have the perfect description of a sensory blueprint. Concentrate on that goal, savor it, taste it, give it color, and smell the dimension. Let it absorb your thoughts and concentration. This ability to use sensory images to marshal one's powerful sensory impulses toward a goal is the essence of self-discipline. We are all born with imagination. Self-disciplined achievers have learned to use it to achieve even the most seemingly impossible goals. The self-disciplined achiever begins the journey to success with imagination. He asks himself, if I can have whatever I can imagine, what do I want? What is my purpose? When he has defined that purpose, he uses his imagination to create a vision of achievement a sensory-rich image that will evoke an emotional response so strong that he is driven to action to bring his vision to life. And when he has achieved that goal, he uses his vision to create new goals, for the self-disciplined achiever never stops. He has learned such a powerful method for becoming successful that the pleasure of succeeding has for him become life itself. The self-disciplined achiever also uses imagination to change his goal whenever necessary. As images evoke emotion, and emotion propels him to act, he gets closer and closer to his goal, and the closer he gets, the more his reality changes. When it changes in such a way as to make his original goal either impossible or undesirable, he changes that goal to fit his new reality. The self-disciplined achiever creates a feedback system that ensures that he will never give up and he will ultimately achieve what he wants. This is where most people fall down. They're working towards a goal and suddenly circumstances interfere with that goal. They get sidetracked. Then when they try to get back on course, it doesn't work. 
Because their original goal does not fit their new reality, they think they have failed and they give up. In the same circumstances, the self-disciplined achiever uses his or her goal visualization as a reality check. If reality suddenly dictates that the original goal won't work, the goal must be altered to fit reality. The achiever has not failed. He or she has set a new course that will lead to success. Take someone who sets out to become an obstetrician. After four years of pre-med and two years of medical school, our self-disciplined achiever suddenly realizes that she's far more interested in becoming a neurologist. Should she drop out of medical school? Of course not. She'll simply switch her visual blueprint to another field of medicine and change her plans for where she'd like to intern after medical school. She doesn't think of herself as a failed obstetrician. She thinks of herself as a successful neurologist. Or take the businessman who wants to open up a retail store in his neighborhood. During the knowledge gathering process of talking to other business owners, discussing loans and insurance with bank officers, and looking into buying franchises, he discovers that a retail operation won't really fit his particular talents or expectations. Instead, he realizes he's a perfect candidate for starting a direct marketing company. So he changes his vision and his direction to fit his new goal. For these people, the fire still burns, but the trial and error process of working towards their goal has led them in directions they wouldn't originally have thought to go in, and they will be successful because they're flexible enough to grow and change as their goals grow and change. The relationship between vision, self-motivation, and achievement can be condensed into an easy-to-understand seven-step formula for developing self-discipline. As we explain that formula, you can refer to your study guide and follow along as we talk about the seven keys to self-discipline outlined in Diagram 3.1. The first step in developing the power of self-discipline is to create a purpose. You must define a cause to which you can wholeheartedly commit your time, resources, and energy. This cause points you in a direction. It gives you a reason for making the effort. It lights a small spark inside you that will soon begin to burn with emotion and drive. The second step is to find role models who have already achieved what you want to achieve. Study their life patterns, their methods and techniques for reaching their goals. Let their example inspire you and realize that they are normal people just like you, but they are self-disciplined people. With the power of self-discipline, you can achieve as much as they have. With a firm purpose in mind and an exciting sense of possibility sparked by your role models, you'll find yourself developing a strong-willed emotional belief in your ability to succeed. The first small spark of hope is turning into a glowing ember of possibility. In the third step, you'll translate your feeling of possibility into a sensory-rich vision of success. At this point, with a vision rich in touch, taste, sight, smell, and sound in front of you, you'll make the leap from the possible, I think I can do it, to the heartfelt, I know I can do it. Your vision and your belief will fan the embers of conviction until they burst into a flame of emotion that incites you to action. This all-encompassing flame of emotion is the fourth step of the formula. It is what gives you the energy, the creative power, and the desire to single-mindedly see your vision through to its successful completion. Motion is the root word for emotion. The original meaning of the word emotion is, in fact, a moving, a stirring, an agitation, which is precisely what happens when belief in your goal catches fire. The fifth step in our formula is planning, the first bit of action inspired by your emotion. Through effective planning, you can identify and map out the steps you need to take in order to make your vision a reality. You'll figure out exactly what you need to do to accomplish your goal and how long it will take. And turning your vision into a concrete goal will further fuel the fires of emotion and action. Once your vision has become a plan, you must acquire the knowledge and skills necessary to implement that plan. This is the sixth step in the formula for developing self-discipline. 
No matter how difficult the learning process might be, you continue to draw inspiration and fortitude from your vision. And each time you master a skill, your confidence in your ability to achieve increases. The seventh and last step in our formula is what we call persistence and perseverance. Persistence is staying with your vision, seeing it through to its completion, no matter how long it takes or how difficult it is. Perseverance is persisting in spite of setbacks, disappointments, and hardship. Once you begin acting to achieve your goal, your drive to sustain the forward motion, to persist and persevere, is constantly fueled by the strength of your initial vision. And as you get nearer and nearer to accomplishment, the vision becomes more and more real. As your vision fuels reality, and reality fuels your vision, your drive to achieve begins working like a giant breeder reactor. You've put into motion a self-perpetuating spiral of vision, belief, emotion, motion, and reality. This formula for harnessing the essence of self-discipline will change your life. For the first time, science has given us the power to truly be able to change our own circumstances from the inside out to understand what makes men and women overcome tremendous odds and obstacles to achieve greatness. For the first time, greatness is within the grasp of each of us. Through the understanding of the scientific principles that govern our thinking and behavior, we can, for the first time, program ourselves for success. In the next session, you'll begin to put the principles you've just learned into action. You'll learn a powerful sensory exercise which will let you determine your true goal. And once you've taken that vital first step, you can begin the exciting journey of action that will propel you towards the ultimate achievement of your heart's desire.